right. So welcome back, everybody, to AMZ Seller Real Talk. I'm Danian Coleman. And with me, I have Mark Jepson, the COO of Managed by Stats, and Patrick Mayoho. And Patrick is going to discuss with us today, uh, which could be tonight for you, doesn't really matter because this is recorded, but um, we're going to discuss supply chain. And a couple of the things that we're going to cover are uh, what's the difference between sourcing when you're first starting out versus when you're at a million and growing? And the other one, which is a hot topic for me personally right now, uh, because I have been doing this myself, is what are the opportunities now? And there's a lot of people talking about sourcing in, in Mexico. So we're going to discuss why China is still important. So um, why don't we go ahead and let's start off with, with the first subject. And that is, what's the difference between when you're first starting out versus when you're growing from a million? Go, Patrick. All right, sure. So, you know, when you're first starting out, uh, you know, we all you know, contact suppliers. Most people are using Alibaba or some sort of trade site and you're buying in smaller volumes. And, you know, as you progress into your million dollar plus in sales, you're already scaling. And when you're scaling comes a lot of headaches. I usually find that uh, a lot of it is in the demand planning and the scheduling. So really kind of identifying, identifying some principles of you know, really how do I plan out what I'm ordering? You know, how am I like putting together POs and mapping out either with a, a spreadsheet or some sort of, you know, uh, 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 program, uh, inventory program on what I need. But then you really get into a lot of the, um, the intricacies of not only what your supplier or your supply base can do as far as what their capabilities are, but what are their capacities? And then really mapping out from there like, do I need backup suppliers for those, you know, and, and how do I mm. arrange that? Um, really getting into forecasting because right now it's so competitive um, with, with so many new entrepreneurs coming out. That's great. A lot of these suppliers now are servicing, you know, more than a handful of customers. And, you know, how do you give yourself an advantage to leverage with your supplier? You know, what can they do for you? How can you forecast to give yourself a better priority or over somebody else? Um, and then going out and qualifying new suppliers. Uh, what information and data do you have uh, that you can take to new suppliers to show them why they should be working with you? So it's almost mm. the approach comes a little different. And I, I like to tell people, you know, at that point in the game, you want to become almost like a salesman um, because you're going to go around to these new suppliers and even your old supplier. And you really got to figure out uh, almost like what we're taught in marketing and, and customer services. What's the customer pain point? You know, what is the supplier mm. pain point? Uh, really figuring out and, and being able to score them, um, uh, you know, with performance data uh, and really being able to track them and, and what they're doing as far as like quality, their pricing, their on time delivery. Uh, so you can really start comparing apples to apples, uh, mm -hmm. your supplier and relationships are always important, too. Um, but really being able to nail down what is going to make you money and and at least sustain or increase uh, your margin. But also in thinking in terms of cash flow, uh, being able to allocate the right amount of cash to your supplier. So being able to work out like terms uh, with a mm -hmm. supplier it really mm -hmm. talks about it. But there's a nuance to that, um, depending on, you know, where your supplier is located, uh, what type of industry they're in. So there's all these different things that we go yeah. get on a rabbit hole. On yeah. this. A lot of it, it's, it's, it's really about development, developing um, your suppliers, but also developing processes and systems to help manage those suppliers and to manage mm. your inventory. Because with most companies, I'm guessing uh, at this point, inventory is still the largest spend. You know, marketing is increasing. You're probably increasing your team, all of that. But yep. I would say the, the, the fair amount, uh, biggest part of the pie is, you know, your inventory. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So, Mark, I'm going to let you comment on this. You've sourced a lot yeah. more product from China than I have or, or, or yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I think what what uh, I guess I want, I want to pick your brain a little bit, uh, Patrick, is like if you have um, uh, different levels of sellers, what would be your kind of advice or kind of direction on someone who's who's doing, you know, one thousand, two thousand units? Um, to them being able to switch over or kind of move up towards uh, doing a 5,000 unit container, you know, uh, level 
uh, orders, what's kind of the best, uh, in your mind, best kind of sequence for going about that? Uh, as far as uh, the process of ordering or like really how to, to scale, like they're already getting sales and they're looking to scale right away. Yeah. Yeah. But in regards to the supplier, like if they're doing, you know, one to 2000 units and they, they want to, you know, really open up their, their volume of how much they're getting from the suppliers, anything they should be aware of or be thinking with, um, oh, yeah. I, I think, the first, you know, the first thing, no one, uh, um, the first thing I would do is, you know, communication is the most important thing with the supplier. Uh, mm. Developing mm. some sort of style of forecasting, which is hard to do, especially when you're first starting out. But if you start seeing those big peaks, I mean, as soon as you can get that in front of your supplier, as soon as you can get that kind of sales data in front of your supplier and forecast out some needs, um, that you're confident enough in extending out. So if you're saying, for example, uh, somebody's ordering one to 2,000 units, you know, uh, and that was at one time three months, and now it's, you know, five to 6,000 units in that three month period, and confidently saying, okay, well, this is going to grow. So getting that out ahead as soon as you can, um, and being able to have them say, okay, well, we, let me back up. I, sometimes I talk too fast and I apologize. Uh, it's okay. I'm, I'm with you on that. Like if, if you listen to it, some of our last podcasts, I'm like, uh, 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 it, I, I never mind. <laughs> getting that five to 6,000 in front of them, uh, but being open to working with them based on their capacity and based on their capabilities. Okay. So this is where getting to know your supplier and really how much they can do 5,000 units or 6,000 units. When you've gone from, you know, one or 2,000 units to five to six may just be a blip on the radar for them. Um, it might not even phase them and they'll say, yep, we can take that order. We can have it done at this time. Um, there's going to be some suppliers that, uh, that much of an increase would be difficult. So having right. a plan and having different options of being able to say, okay, uh, you know, let's work on how much can you do? If you can do this order, then let's, you know, release one month at a time for the next three months and come up with a release schedule to keep that influx going. So just being adaptable and you know, to work and communicate with your supplier um, on what you see on the horizon uh, is, is really the most important thing. I know a lot of people get skittish because no one has a crystal ball. And, you know, as, as someone who has been on the sales side, as well as the supply chain side, we call it a forecast for a reason, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, no, that's, that's what the weatherman calls it too. We right. know how often they're right. PO, right, until POs come in, I mean, people can forecast stuff all day long, but until yeah. POs come in, the you know that back up the forecast is still just a forecast. So, you know, part of it is is communicating, getting in them at least in the mindset of preparing that your your volumes are going to increase. Okay, nice, cool. Good. You have you have more to to ask on that one, or did that fully answer your question, Mark? Yeah, no, I think that made sense. Cool. Let's yeah. talk about you know, the newbies. I'll add, I'll, add, I'll add to that too, if you don't mind, because I just thought it was too. Yeah, no. We're in, a, we're, in a, we're in a spot right now where, you know, especially coming out of Asia, uh, the logistics market is really volatile, right? Like, yeah. Know, even in China right now, there's shutdowns and it's affecting container loading times and it's affecting the ports and everything. Yeah. So not everyone's going to be an expert and, and you shouldn't expect yourself, but having an awareness of, what may be happening geopolitically and talking to your freight forwarder. I mean, a good freight forwarder is going to be, you know, one of your biggest assets. Yeah. Um, Cause they'll do all the negotiating and fixing and, and handle all the problems on your behalf. Is that right? That's true. They, they will do that, but they, they also know the pulse of what's happening. You know, yeah. they're the ones dealing every day. I mean, you only talk to them, you know, myself, I only talk to my freight forwarder obviously when I need something or when I'm curious. But you know yeah. those guys. I've had the same ones for. I've worked in the same freight forwarder for eleven years. I treat them like insurance agents. Where mm. every year I go out and I get a competitive analysis done. But I've had such a good relationship with them. It would take a, a monumental, you know, event for me to want to switch. Yeah. But the the those people, uh, my team that that we partnered with, they know the market so well. They know what's happening because they're working on it every single day for other customers. So, you know, for me to, to send an email out to Kim, let's say, and 
hey, you know, how are things looking right now? What are prices like? You know, uh, because sometimes there's going to be an event that is going to slow everything down. And next thing you know, a 30 day uh, turnaround ends up becoming 60 or 90 days, as we saw last year. Yeah, it's right. like the holidays for your manufacturers. Like, great, I need this order done in the next three weeks. Like, cool, in three days, we're going on holiday for three months. Like, ah! <laughs> well, I, I've told, you know, even some of my clients right now that I'm, I'm coaching that, uh, you know, it, again, it's hard to have a crystal ball, but even if you go by last year's data and say, yeah. you know, plus or minus 5%, try to get your orders in now. Try to get your orders in now. Try to get, you know, your place in line and try to get your stuff booked middle of summer because you want it here, you know, August, September. You might hold on mm. to it for a little bit, but you know, how many stories did we hear last year where the, the you know, logistics and, and the ports were so backed up and our ports here were so backed up yeah. that people were not getting their deliveries on time. And then you compound that on how Amazon, let's say for the Amazon sellers, how the FBA works and how slow the check-ins were last year really yep. thinking ahead and say, okay, what's, what's more valuable right now, the time or the money in my, yep. for my personal business, it's the time making sure my stuff is there is yep. worth a little bit extra cost to make sure it's here. Otherwise you lose those opportunities. And that has, I think a greater ripple effect than anything else. Absolutely. What, what would be the kind of some key um, stable things to think with uh, both for the new person and, you know, huge sellers of, of that forecasting element, like what what things can they think with in order to try to have the best uh, uh, supply chain system in, in place? Sure. So my uh, my first um, like my first advice I normally tell people is like, what does your team look like? Like not people that work for you, but people that do the work for you. So like your logistics partner, you know, your freight forwarder, you know, uh, tell me about them. Uh, are you using a warehouse or are you using your own space? Like you have to kind of figure out like the steps in the system. So let's say if you're going to sell on Amazon, I'll use them. That's usually the, the one that everybody wants to know. So right. I say backwards. I say, okay, I have to have this here on this date in FBA. And then I, I pad the time and I work myself backwards to when I need to order it. Okay. A lot of mm -hmm. that is you're using different teams. You're using a freight forwarder. You're using a warehouse. You know, you're using uh, your supplier uh, or an agent to buy for you. And making sure that you're well connected with those teams is the best thing that you can do. You know, asking them basic questions of what's the market look like right now? You know, are you seeing any uh, problems? Um, even ask them like, hey, I'm looking at this for holiday. When do you need to know how much space I need for the warehouse or, you know, yeah. how to or fulfillment, like when do you need this information by? Because I'm getting ready to prepare for it now. And I think, you know, the, the, the saying early bird gets the worm, uh, but it's true in this case, because um, I think the last two years have really disrupted how we do things. Um, and I can say with, with a groan, supply chain was like that dirty word. I mean, we still hear it now politically, right? That supply yeah. chain is a word, but it is because we become we, we become so used to over the last decade or so um, with how efficient China and Asia have become with our products I and mean, getting them here. When when COVID hit and backed everything up, that ripple effect is still there right now. Yeah. So I yeah, absolutely. So I think having your team put together is, and knowing who they are and having communication with them is the best thing that you can do. And then mapping out your numbers again from when you need to have it at in the customer's hands and then work your way back on when you need to order it. All right. So let's uh, let's quickly ask and answer the question for the new guys. What are all the like? So when I first ordered my product from China, I just had the, the, the factory handle everything all the way up to getting it to my door. Right. I know now that that is not the right, not necessarily generally not the right way to go about it. So uh, what is what are the pieces that a new person needs to know about just the basics to get that they should have in place when they're going to do their first order? Oh, sure. and one other thing, 
I also never had anyone inspect my product, which cost me a lot of bad reviews. Um, well, first of all, know your product. You know, uh, to be honest, quite frankly, with, with you, uh, when I first started out, I had a really simple plastic mold injective product. It was like one of those little uh, meat shredding claws. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't need it. I knew I didn't need expansion. You know, uh, yeah. If I had something that was like an electronic company, um, you know, I would I would start researching agents. I was re start researching inspections. I mean, they're important. I think you want to yeah. have a good lot, a good percentage of it inspected. It gives you, you know, you know, I, you can do 100% inspections depending on what it is, depending on what kind of certifications like your product has to have. But I would normally say, you know, a good random sampling of, of 20% is a, it will give you okay. a good start. If you end up seeing some numbers of that 20% and like if you start seeing 10%, then you're going to say, no, I need the whole thing inspected. And then you negotiate with the supplier that they're going to have to pay for it. And those yeah. are the kind of agreements I've come up with on that. Um, with, with new buyers, um, my, my suggestion is know your INCO terms. So INCO terms are a way of buying things. So most times uh, when you're working with China, especially like on Alibaba, you're going to have- Wait, experts. wait, let's, let's define sure. that real quick. Is that I-N-C-O, INCO, or A-N-C-O? Yes. No, INCO, it's I-N-C-O. Okay. I-N-C-O terms. Um, there's a lot of resources on the internet that you can use that'll show you like what each one's means. But the three most important ones that, you know, I've used for the most part, I shouldn't say the three most important, three most common ones are X works, which means you're buying it from the factory door. And then you're responsible from the factory to the port, to the U S port, to your destination. Okay. Then mm -hmm. you have FOB, which means freight on board. That means mm -hmm. the supplier takes care of everything all the way to the exporting port. So if you're buying from China, they take care of everything, including all the paperwork um, up to port. And then there's mm -hmm. DDP, which is delivered duty paid. That means the supplier will handle everything, including all the customs costs and inspections and everything to your door. So those right. are the three most common ones. Um, I, I personally like to have them quote in all three because I want to see, okay. the reason why I have them quote in all three, because I want to see what the convenience costs are. Mm -hmm. what, what's the cost of them to do all the paperwork? What's the cost mm -hmm. that they're going to do for the delivery? And seeing that, uh, you know, I have like, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to, I have a team in China. Okay. And mm -hmm. I have a team in Vietnam. So a lot of those guys, they do all the work for us anyways, but I still mm -hmm. like to get, I want to see what those costs are. And when you start understanding those costs, it does give you more information and it gives you a, a better leverage, at least from appearing that you know what you're talking about when you go to start negotiating. You know, I think yeah. the, most, the more knowledgeable you are, the better you're going to be at the negotiating. Absolutely. Yeah. The more, yeah, definitely. The more knowledge you have, the more control you have. Otherwise you're at the mercy of someone uh, of, of, uh, you know, sing love, over in China saying, yes, dear, this is the best option for you, right? right. Um, <laughs> which if, if anyone has dealt, anyone listening has actually been on Alibaba or dealt with people in China, that's, you'll get what I'm saying and why I said that. Um, I've never called, been called dear more, more times in my life than when speaking to someone in China. <laughs> well, and a lot of guys uh, that I've worked with and worked for and does in business with all over the years that have experience overseas. The one thing that we all agree on is yes does not always mean yes. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah that's an important one. Yes does not always mean yes. Yes means yeah. I hear you. Mm -hmm. Yes means I understand what you're saying. Yes means I know that's what you want. Yes yeah. does not mean I'm going to do it. Yeah. Yep. I definitely found that one too. And you know, the, I was going to say the next thing I, I would tell somebody too, especially at the beginning, and I tell people like coach right now that you you really need again knowing your product to be as detailed as you can on your purchase orders. You know, yeah. having checked out 
uh, I, I put my specs, I put my KPIs, and I'll, I put that on the purchase order because that's a contract. Um, and that's yeah. what the expectation is. And you may agree to something on Alibaba. You may agree to something by email. But oh, once man, that I've done that. Started, you need, you, that's the expectation. Yeah. Yeah, and that, and that, that really, was. It really helps when you get terms. Having that, then if something doesn't happen right, you have that contract and and it, uh, it it gives you a lot more leverage. Yeah, definitely. All right, cool. So what we have right now for the beginners are know your terms, right? DDP, FOB, and XWorks are the most common. And we have um, have an inspector take about twenty percent of your of your product and and make sure there's no trends of crap, basically. Yes doesn't yeah. always mean yes. Yes means nothing at all in terms of how you think yes means. And um, so what about, we? and we touched on having a freight forwarder. And essentially for those that don't know, a freight forwarder is someone that handles, that, that you go to that, uh, you probably gleaned what it means, but it basically means they're gonna handle everything. So if you're doing XWorks, the freight forwarder is gonna go over to the, they're gonna send the truck to go pick up your container or your pallets or whatever bring it to port, bring it to the air, airfield, whatever, get it over and all the way to your de final destination of your either your house or your office. Yep. Um, now, w are there any other, is there any other part of the process that somebody should know about? And and I'll, and I'll preface this with something that, that I went through personally is um, when, when, I, when I had something sent FOB, I didn't realize that that meant that I had to handle customs, right? So I had to actually go through all the paperwork and, and stuff like that to, to, to get that done. And I also found that if, so I, I was doing, I still am, I've still got them, camping blankets, right? So I had an RN number, which was super simple to get. And I, I said to the government, this is what I do. I need an RN number and this is, this is the company that it's attached to. So rather than putting your company name on the textile that's being imported, you just put an RN number. And quite frankly, I can't even remember what the convenience of that was, but it was something I just didn't know about on my first order. So is there any other part of the process of the product arriving to the customer, the, 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 new, the new person's door that they should know about? So again, having a, a good freight forwarder that will do your customs paperwork for you. Um, so my freight forwarder that we use here, usually when I have an order that's going to come in to the U.S., it's hey, here's my you know here's my uh, bill of lading, here's my invoice. Here's Can you my... define a bill of lading, please? Because that's probably sure. a not commonly understood term. Sure. Your bill of lading is basically um, basically a a form that's filled out that says on this container, this carrier picked up these amount of goods. And there's usually a description of the goods, the date that it was picked up, um, a lot of time your container number, all that will be on there. And then you'll get what they call a telex release. And the telex release means that the supplier now is turning this goods on this bill of lading over to you, the consignee. So there's the consignor, which is your your supplier, and then there's your consignee. So that's mm -hmm. just basic super overview. You can get way more detail. Cool. No, um, that's fine. But then what will happen is, uh, you know, you give your invoice packing slip, and then the freight forwarder will do all of the customs clearance forms for you. Um, and there's usually like ISF forms, some other ones that you have to fill out that are basically go to customs. Now, again, freight forwarder big team member, make sure that your freight forwarder understands what the harmonization codes are. So again, part of that PO process is, you know, I like to have, you know, my description, but when the supplier fills it out in the packing slip, it doesn't always reflect everything. We come to an agreed terminology based on what my freight forwarder recommends. So if I have, let's say garments or textiles, you're, you need to be very specific with your HS or some people call it HTS code. And then I make sure the description of my product matches what the description of the harmonization code is. And that's so the HS or HTS code? Yes. Harmonization, so, okay. 
if you work with your freight forwarder, you'll say, hey, I have this widget and it's made of this. You kind of give them a description. Your freight forwarder will go and and they'll look at the, the harmonization codes, okay? Mm. So it's basically standard code that lets customs know what is coming into the country, okay? Mm-hmm. So it's universal between like, China has their export code and then there's an import code. One of the yeah, things I- A lot of people don't think with this, when they're first learning how to sell on Amazon, um, or when they're starting another product, you know, uh, adding a product to their existing product line, or whatever it is, they don't think with, you know, like you said, knowing your product, right? You have to know it so much more than just, oh, this is the extra feature that I'm adding to this product. You have to know what it's made out of, what, you know, what kind of codes are going to be associated with it when it gets to that whole importing line. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So that the, the importance of that HS code, I think, is is way more important than people realize. Yep. And being, you know, and not, not everybody when you're first starting right we're all worried about getting sales i mean that's what we what, that's what's going to bring the revenue to bring us the growth but then mm-hmm. part of those things of you know developing your your processes and systems like like the the little cheat i'll give everybody right now like insider tip whatever you want to call it, hot tip is you know i was kind of referring to it before but once you figure out what your hts code is there's usually a description with it right so whatever my product is i'll have like my product number and then the description but I, I add the exact harmonization code nomenclature like underneath it. So mm. that way when an inspector is looking at it, it'll match up and they'll just see you know the products. Um, mm. I, I know of a few people that have gotten, like they, they've had their stuff sort of seized and held for inspection at customs because of a little mistake in wording, you know, like threw up a red flag and then next thing you know, like they're two weeks behind because of that. Yeah. I've had that happen. Little detail things like that. It can make a big difference. Absolutely. Okay, cool. You've had that happen. You've had you've had had seized. Yeah, I have. We won't get into it. (laughs) Nothing illicit, but uh but yeah, I've I've had it seized and and until I, I was able to get um I forget what I had to get something chemical documentation or something like that from the manufacturer. And that was, that went from Slovakia to England and then England to there. And they didn't know what they were doing. And I didn't know what I was doing. Like I, I wasn't the one responsible for shipping it. I just said, Hey, get it to me and then Mm -hmm. I'll sell it. And then like, Hey, sir, we, you owe us money because uh, your product's been seized. I'm like, Oh, <laughs> it's funny how that the stuff like this comes up and it, it kind of goes back to that same point of like really having connections to yeah. people who know what they're doing and have and, and know all the details of what how it all goes because you know following advice or, or getting advice from someone who actually knows what they're doing you're gonna you're gonna save so many pitfalls um, yep. it's just it's just ridiculous yep. and, you know it's, it's funny like again, it goes back to knowing your product and, and knowing what you need, you know, asking questions. Uh, I always encourage you to just keep asking questions. Ask, you know, when you have your product, ask your su- supplier, like, hey, like, do you offer any certifications on this or do I need any certifications? Mm-hmm. Even when you're mm-hmm. bringing the product to your freight forward, get your harmonization code for customs, ask them, hey, do you know if I need any kind of certification? Like research on the internet, uh, you know, if you have to have something uh, the, the last thing I want to see is somebody spending a lot of money, um, you know, starting a business, bringing something in, and they didn't know that they had to have a, you know, a certification to get it through yeah. customs. They didn't know yeah. they had to have a PE certification from the supplier mm-hmm. to, sell it to a retailer uh, or to sell it online. You know, it, yeah. it, it, it's almost heartbreaking when you hear that. And then, you know, what can you do to help them recover? I mean, you got to pivot quickly, but those are things that I, I'd like to help people avoid going. Yeah, when they're starting out too. and that that would be electronics for those of you that that are out there. That if you're looking at le- electronics, you'd best have that CE certification before you try and get it into this country. This country being America, you know, by the way. All that stuff. I mean, there's, there's, you know, a lot of products have it. I mean, I I think uh, uh, a question to mine was going to do like some wood products. You know, there's 
you know, wood products from, from China or Vietnam, like depending on what the application is, you have to get some certification, especially if it's food, like salad tongs or something, you know, you got to have, right. You know, you know, that brings up a very good point on a project that we've currently got going, Mark, if we're going to do that, that wooden box for that product, yeah. then yeah. maybe, maybe we need some sort of certification on that. Absolutely. Yeah. Something to check out. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, cool. Conversation for another time. Now, I would. I, I think that pro- probably gives even even our people who are experienced. Like I have imported stuff, and uh, and I just learned some things that I didn't know before. So, I think that's awesome. why I love doing this stuff. So you're never let's old cover... enough to stop learning. So that's for sure. What say that again, Mark? You're, you're never old enough to stop learning. That's right. You can. I yeah, yeah, you can you can teach this do- old dog new tricks. All right, let's cover topic number two. I feel that a lot of people are going to be very interested in this right now. I know I, for one, are. What are our opportunities now? Um, I personally am looking into manufacturing my blankets in Mexico because of the the cost involved. Like my my blankets are very expensive, right? Um, not in compared to some things, but I, I keep, I keep my price at a competitive level, right? So I got fed up with, so I've been through three manufacturers, four manufacturers as it is, right? Not a single one of them have produced exactly what I've asked for. And we agreed upon in email, like you were saying <laughs> earlier. <laughs> okay. But so I'm looking in my, Me- at, at Mexico now. Now, I'll give you a very recent experience that has also made Mexico a slight turnoff for me is that I've I've been working with this um, company that goes out and finds manufacturers. I sent them my products for samples and 40 days later they hadn't received it. And USPS or UPS or whoever we sent it from said it's, it's out being delivered. Well, I just got the package back two days ago and it's, we're, we're about day 50, something like that. And so, um, I, I have a feeling that the logistics are not as in tune as China. Let's face it. No, I don't think anybody is, but China, China has developed an enormous amount of technology and infrastructure to streamline everything. So I think that to compare it directly to China is kind of a losing battle. But the fact that I that I shipped my product to a specified address and it didn't get there is like insanely aggravating to me. You know, Mm -hmm. it's not about the money. It's about the time right now. I would like to be able to take a five hour flight and just say, hola, you know, donde, el, donde esta el baño and get to work. You know what I mean? And like, I, I know a lot more Spanish than I do uh, Chinese. And culturally, culturally speaking, I grew up with an, an enormous amount of Mexicans and have tons of Mexican families that are my friends. And, you know, so culturally, it's it's much easier for me to, to uh, integrate, right? So what are we looking at when it comes to, we've got trade shows, multiple trade shows coming up in Mexico about sourcing in Mexico. So why is China still the place to go? And is it? For now, China will continue to dominate, uh, especially in the, let's say retail ready products Mm -hmm. section. I think China's still going to dominate. Uh, okay. And for some people who know me, this is usually the word that I say that people cringe, but daisy chain. Uh, so daisy chain, what that means is you can go to like one supplier and he's not doing it all within house, right? He's got like a network of partners. It's like a Bluetooth speaker. One guy does the wire loom. One guy mm-hmm. does the circuit board. One guy makes the plastic mold for your speaker. Okay. He's got all of those people tied together into what they call a daisy chain. Okay. And in all of my years, this is pre-supply chain. Daisy chain is pre-supply chain. Yeah. <laughs> it's pre-supply chain. 
in all my years, I've, I have yet to see anyone that can do it as effectively as China. Culturally, mm. they, they network as good, if not better than we do. Um, a little mm. backstory, my first time in China, I felt like I was in an episode of Mad Men because everything was done like 1950 style. Everybody like you drank during lunch, you made deal, blah, blah, blah. It was a whole uh, thing, yeah. right? Yeah, but they all network and 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 they and they take their networking seriously. They take their partnership seriously. Every time you ask a supplier if you've been able to travel to China or, or mostly anywhere in Asia, and if you ask them like, "Hey, I'm thinking about adding this to my product." Yep, I know a guy. Hang on a second. They will put their cigarette down. They'll yeah. get on their phone. They'll start talking, and he's like, yep. "Okay, we can go. Let's go. We'll go meet this guy." Like that's what they can do. Okay? Yeah nobody else in the world comes close to being able to do that right now right? Mm -hmm. so china will still be important however um you know we china has a 25 year head start over everybody as well yeah. um and uh, the rest of the world uh as a consumer the rest of the world has basically you know funded their infrastructure to be able to do this and that's awesome yeah. i mean it's uh, for a long time, they were very efficient at it, and and they're still very good at it as far as being able to do it. Um, yeah. But where we are right now in the world, it is start, it is time to start looking at other places. And okay, you know, part of, part of what I've done over the years is what we call risk mitigation. It's finding you know either a different country or a different region to source your products for these exact times for when there's yep. you know a risk of disruption. Um, and that's what a lot of the big boys do. You know, a lot of, a lot of the bigger companies have, have been doing that for years. And I think for us as entrepreneurs, we have do to you start- you say beer companies? Bigger companies. Bigger. Oh, bigger. bigger like I heard beer are, companies. No, sorry. It's, sorry. it's 446, so. <laughs> it is. It's, yeah, it's um, And I apologize. Sometimes, again, I, I, I go really fast, so. No, it's uh, fine. It's fine. I just heard, uh, apparently I heard what I, my mind wanted me to hear. Right. That was all. <laughs> but a lot of the big boys do it, uh, whether it's in manufacturing or even retailers, they will start, you know, sourcing not only multiple suppliers, but sourcing from multiple regions mm. and they will start developing. So at the very least right now, no matter where you are at, what someone should be doing is looking at other regions to go into. Okay. Again, this is knowing your product. You know, yep. what can you do in Mexico? Like, what is Mexico good at? What are their natural resources? I mean, it's, it's thinking this outside of the box because Mexico, more than likely right now, I haven't looked it up, but Mexico is not going to build you a Bluetooth speaker. Right. Not, you know, not the same way that, that you can get from, from China. Yep. Can they? I, I do believe they have the capability to, but it's going to take enough of us to go in and develop these suppliers. There are things that you can get right away out of Mexico, textiles, you know, I think would, some would some I think. Products wood products, mm -hmm. uh, you, plastic injection mold. Um, the furniture mm -hmm. industry, actually, the furniture and the auto industries were very ahead of everybody when they started investing into Mexico years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so they've already got some suppliers that are established that do component work, that can do some light assembly, um, but it's been focusing automotive and furniture. Uh, right. But I think there's guys out there now that, you know, understanding again understanding your product and what you need can give you the direction now mexico may not be for everybody uh, mexico is going to take a while to develop uh, it's going to take some work and people putting in time to go there um, really understanding your product and, and walking them through what needs to be done and helping them set up a daisy chain mm -hmm. uh, so then there's other countries uh, you know brazil i think is is positioned pretty well especially with aluminum and wood um, mm out of there uh eastern europe was looking really good up until about you know two months ago uh when politically some things started happening there uh yeah. you know uh you know ukraine was was pulling you know, people were pulling a lot of aluminum out of ukraine and, and some other items so i mean really understanding like where you can go and what countries have what resources india is great mm -hmm. for again textiles they're really good at iron they're good at plastic injection molding okay mm -hmm. so what items can you pull out of there or what items can you develop there and how to and how to work with them? 
how does one find that out? Do you just do a Google search? What is this country export or manufacturing? What are their expertises in these areas? Or sure. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat. I, I'm a big fan okay. of trying to find an agent that mm -hmm. I can hire um, in that country. Uh, I've done that in Brazil. Um, I don't have teams established, but I do have agents that I've worked with in different countries where okay. I can call them and, and hire them uh, you know, as a subcontractor for a short term basis to do research, to go mm -hmm. out and pre vet suppliers for me, um, trying to figure out what capabilities are. I mean, the people who know the best are those types of people. So yeah, if you, that makes sense. If you Google, and it, and it kind of honest, you can actually find them on, um, on Upwork. I mean, Upwork's a good resource. Huh. Look, up, look up sourcing agents for a country um you know nice i never has, I wouldn't even thought have thought of that yeah so i mean are, are you gonna hit home runs every time no you get some base hits yep you get somebody that can give you some basic information yep uh you know i think trading companies might have a bad name because everybody's always trying to avoid the trading company but trading companies are networked like no other yeah well. so yeah that's that's something that i learned when i was in china last is that was you know, I was always told, yeah, stay away from the trading companies. That's it's just the middleman that that's going to make cost you more money. But yep. at the same time, I know that I've been able to go. Can you do this? And they go, yeah. hang on. And they do exactly what you just said they do. Hang on, I know a guy. Let me make a phone call. Yes, mm -hmm. we can do that. This is the price. And I go, okay, cool, right? So, and and that was done. That was done at the Canton Fair on the spot. I'm like this is my here's my existing product. This is what I want to change. Blah blah blah. He's like, yeah, can can I take this a second? Like, yeah, yeah, go for it. He ran off, right? I'm like, weird. Okay, I'll, like, I'll sit here and drink a water. And he comes back and like, okay, he's got like a notepad with all kinds of scribbles on it, and clearly they've weighed it and and licked it and like, mm, and then, yeah, this is twenty denier, and uh, and then he goes, this is the price. I go, okay, cool, that's awesome. And uh, so I, I, there, I definitely have my own personal experience, and 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 it's good. But uh, you know, if you don't want to, if you don't want to pay that extra money, well, yeah, <laughs> good I mean, luck flying to China. Right, right, now. right. For that that convenience of that person knowing those people or what things to ask, or what things to check for, and. When you first get started on Amazon, I think it's imperative that you use someone like this who actually knows what they're doing, yeah. has the, the connection points to these other companies. <clears throat> and once you're, you've been selling your product for a couple of years, you know like all the ins and outs, you know what to look for, what to, you know, yeah, then okay, you can look at, okay, maybe you can source it from some other uh, uh, company or get rid of the middleman or whatever it is, but you, you really need to know your stuff and, and you're, when you get first get started, you don't. You you, you really don't. And you have to, there's yeah. so much that you don't know about it that you need to have that 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 connection. Otherwise, you're liable to fall into to some sort of problem uh, along the way. I still yeah. work with trading companies. I mean, yeah. I work directly with some manufacturers. I still have some trading companies because I've had relationships with them for years. I look at a trading company again, another extension of a team that you're building. You know, we yeah. talk yeah. about a order or your three PL. If you have a good trading company that provides you value, pay for the value. It's yeah. worth it. Um, yep. Yep. I know people, I know people want to go direct to manufacturer because everybody wants to save money. But in what I call the triangle, money is just part of it. You know, there's also quality and there's also on time delivery. And mm. you're you're not gonna get all three to be perfect. You're not gonna get what is it, the isosceles triangle where all three of them, you know, are the same. Like you're not gonna get that. What you yeah. have to start to discern is what is the most value because what you pay up front a little bit more by using a trading company that may just do the inspections for you because they're worried about the performance mm -hmm. will save thousands of dollars in the end because either you didn't have to hire an inspector or your stuff uh, came in and the quality was good. Like it's about avoiding, you know, avoiding right. a lot of those, avoiding a lot of those, those things that can cause you a lot of headaches. So, Having yeah. a good trading company, so finding one in a country, you know, in Mexico, I've done it. I mean, I've looked up trading companies in Mexico because, you know, I have ideas. I'm curious about it. Um, you know, working with them and and networking 
to provide value as someone that wants to buy, providing value to those suppliers or those people there too, because they don't know what we're looking for nine times out of 10, right? So they're right. learning. So having that sort of mindset that, uh, you know, we're, we're gonna learn from each other to develop something uh, is pretty important. Absolutely. Cool. And it also goes back to um, something that uh, some sellers don't necessarily think with at the get go is what is what is your goal or what do you think your goal is for your company right now? You know, if you're going to be in the long run thinking with, oh, I want to sell this company, I want to get it big and sell it and then, you know, go off and do whatever you like after that. You need to have a team in place where you can turn over that connection, that Very supplier, good point. That, that person who's going to be handling that portion of the whole supply chain system. If you can't turn that over and it's all in your head, you're going to have, you know, that's going to be part of the turnover. Whereas if you can just say, hey, here's the contact, here's the guy, this is how it goes, boom, done. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. And I think having an operational mindset, and that's where, you know, a lot of this goes beyond sourcing. Most of us as e commerce sellers are not manufacturing anything, we're not doing the assembly. A lot of us, I would say, are uh, turning just turning products over, which is awesome. But having that operational mindset of thinking that way of where do all these pieces fall? You know, who's responsible for what? And even if you don't have stuff hired, I like to have, I mean, I have an org chart and my org chart yeah. includes people who do not actually work for me, but that I pay provide a service that make right. our business what it is. And yeah, absolutely. If you need to have that, especially if you're training somebody, like if you're bringing on new team members, you need to show them where everything falls into place. Yep. Absolutely. Cool. Well, I think that uh, we can start bringing this to a close. Um, Mark, any final questions you have? Uh, burning desires of knowledge you'd like Patrick to to impart on us? Yes. Thank you for <laughs> completing my bullshit. <laughs> I like how you guys can each other stuff, man. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no, that's no, good. Okay. Um, boom, 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 boom. I'll take that as a no, and I'll yeah, let you think about think that's that. That's good. Yeah. Patrick, any any final words of wisdom from you? Oh. Not really. Always I mean, carry cash. Yeah, always carry cash. I mean, cash is king. Um, yeah. No, I, I would say that you know, don't be afraid to take your time. Like, don't be afraid to take a step back and try to figure out like if you're missing something like we don't know we don't know right so yeah, yep. you know contact someone that that maybe is in our world that you can pick their brains and and don't be afraid to ask questions like when you first start out you're not going to know it all and no one expects you to so don't be afraid because there are plenty of people like us uh, three of us that you know happy to answer questions and help you know and sure. then make sure that you know you're always communicating cool all right, good. Yeah, and, and be willing to make mistakes along the way and expect to make mistakes that will cost you some money. They will. Yeah, they will. Yep. They will. Now, All right, well, yeah, and learn. Yeah, that's the most important thing. Yeah, actually, yeah. Kind of funny story. I've been uh, considering making a presentation called Danon's Decade of Mistakes oh. since I've been doing this for about a decade and then just going, what was my mistake? How did it negatively impact things and what was the right way to do it that I may or may not have done, but that's not important. I'm going to tell people that's what should be done. Right. But yeah. And, and, and like, I think, I think all three of us, we have spent many, many, many tens of thousands of dollars making mistakes, things that were in many cases avoidable by the simple knowledge of having a freight forwarder or something like that. So um, thank you very much, Patrick, for coming on. And if someone would like to reach out to you, how, wh where do they go? And, and uh, do you want them to? No, oh, please. Uh, I'm more than welcome to contact me. I am on LinkedIn, uh, so okay. you can find me there. Uh, you can also contact me by my email, uh, which is patrick at readyproductsllc.com. And I, I believe cool. you have that. You might be able to post it, whatever. Uh, they're more you know, happy to, to contact me that way as, as well. Cool. And this is Patrick Maioho, M-A-I-O-H-O, -O, Patrick spelled Patrick. So yes. thank you very much for being on and uh, it's great to have you here. And I'm going to go ahead and end the podcast right here. All right. Sweet. Thank you.